Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 440th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Catherine Murphy and Ksenia M. Soboleva. We're thrilled to have the writer Lynn Crawford here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Uh, here at The Rail, we acknowledge that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll be posting in just a moment. And over the past 21 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing, bringing together in a single monthly publication art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, alongside thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. This December, we are raising $150,000 in 31 days, and your contributions will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and our operations here at The Rail for the coming year. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guest and host, artist Catherine Murphy graduated from Pratt Institute of New York in 1967. Her complex figurative work, work deals mostly with simple everyday subjects without drawing from photographic material. She lives and works in Poughkeepsie, New York, and her current exhibit of recent work is on view at Peter Freeman through January 8th of 2022. And our host today, writer, art historian, and curator, Ksenia M. Soboleva, is based in New York City and specializes in queer art and culture. She received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts with a dissertation on art and lesbian identity during the AIDS crisis, and was the 2020-2021 Marika and Jan Vilcek Curatorial Fellow at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, where she co-organized the Jillian Wearing Retrospective on view through April 4th of next year. So without further ado, over to you, Ksenia. Thank you, Nick. And thank you to everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for making this conversation possible. Um, and thank you to Catherine for joining us today. I am so excited to be in conversation with you. You are such a key figure, both in the history and the present moment of American painting. And you have a beautiful exhibition up right now at P Peter Freeman Gallery, as Nick mentioned, titled Recent Work, which I encourage everyone to see. Um, and I think we can start going through the slideshow now. And we've, we've made a selection of, um, of early works to accompany the works that are, um, that are in the current show. Ben? And uh, when I went to see the exhibition, my first impression was, and I know that this has become a very trendy thing to say, but I felt that the pandemic very much resonated in the work. But then I realized that those qualities that I was associating with the pandemic um, have always been a defining feature of your work, this sense of isolation, the focus on the mundane, uh, a certain immobility. I love the painting, which I guess we'll see in a bit, or maybe it has come by already, of the of the two button-up shirts in the suitcase. And you know, it makes me think of this pause that there was on travel. And uh, you once said that uh, you paint to slow things down. And so I'm curious what it was like for you, even though I know that most of these paintings you started way before the pandemic, because your paintings take years. But I, I'm wondering what it was like for you to be working on these during the pandemic when we were forced to slow down. Um, well, the pandemic really didn't change our lives very much because we just work all the time anyway. So it was what we do. Uh, and the paintings um, are a reflection of everything I think and feel. So uh, the pandemic is certainly there, you've not mistaken that. But um, most of the time, uh, always, um, the, the subject matter is generally not my primary focus. It usually comes out of some formal in, in interest I have. And then somehow the subject matter bleeds in or it becomes one with the, with the form. But it's not, it's not like, oh, we're in a pandemic, how am I gonna express what I feel? Uh, it's more like uh, none of the above. I mean, mostly I just, it, it, honestly, it, the, 
conscious level of adding of narrative is, doesn't happen to me. It's it is almost always um, uh, a melding of of one necessity to another necessity, which is like a poem, the form and the content are, when it is successful, when the painting is successful, it is one thing. So the pandemic, I cannot deny the pandemic is there, but I am also 76 years old. The pandemic has been here for a long time, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, that you're right. There, there's always some anxiety in my work. There's always um, what I see around me, uh, what I think about, what I dream, a lot of paintings come out of dreams. So I'm not denying it, but I can't say that it was intentional. It's just there. I mean, the, the ripped up self-portrait, mm -hmm. I was most interested in, you know, the, I, I did the drawings specifically to rip them up. So I just did self-portraits and said, oh, this one looks like a good one to rip up mm -hmm. because the subject of that drawing is the rip. And so I, uh, you know, I just, it, it worked that it was like, I, what would it be like to depict a rip? So, and I also wanted to have another grid in the, in this group of paintings. And I said, oh, I'll make it a grid like Nightwatch. So it, it generally, um, I'm led by that more than most other things. And I've done lots of self portraits because I'm the only person who's willing to sit for me for as long as someone needs to sit for me. So it's sometimes it's out of necessity. So I'm not skirting your, your read, but in fact, this kind of anxiety is always part of my life. Yeah, no, you're actually confirming it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. No, exactly. At first I thought, oh, this is so pandemic related. And then I was like, no, this has always been your work. Yes, it is. It's um, always been my work. Yeah. Do you, but do you it, feel yes. like, but sorry, go ahead. Do you feel like you were more productive in a way? Because I know you often turn down social engagements to paint. Well, and there were no I, social engagements. I will say that I was, I was not unhappy that I didn't have to disappoint people because of not coming to their party because nobody had any parties. So uh, that was actually a relief. But uh, uh, it was, it was not. It was a it was a good time. We were both my husband and I were both very productive, and we got a lot done. It's true. I, I, it doesn't look like I got a lot done, but in fact, they were very hard paintings that I did get them no, done. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, proud of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm I'm happy to hear that because I know that you know for a lot of people, even though at first there was this like yes now, now that we have to slow down, we're gonna write that novel and we're gonna make that yeah. painting, and but then it's sort of you know when when it's forced things to, the creativity tends to be negated yeah. in a certain way so so it's good to hear that that was not the case for you um and i i know that you think about poetry a lot in relation to your painting and uh elizabeth bishop is your favorite who i am not as familiar with but oh you're uh, in the treat <laughs> for me for me your work um always makes me think of mary oliver's poetry and i think that uh that Elizabeth Bishop and Mary Oliver shared this, this dedication to, to really what it means to pay attention. Uh, one of my favorite Mary Oliver lines is, I don't know exactly what a prayer is, but I do know how to pay attention. And what, what that says to me is that um, you don't have to be religious to be devoted. Mm -hmm. And so I guess my question to you is, uh, where did you learn to pay attention? and and I know that um, religion played a role in your upbringing. So do you feel that in certain ways you were able to, to translate um, those expectations of religion, the, the sort of expected devotion into painting and to the point that perhaps you even view painting as a religion in itself? Um it's very I'm I'm always interested in my relationship to having been brought up Catholic uh, and it isn't just the fact that I was brought up Catholic but in fact when I was younger nobody brought me to museums so the only images I saw were religious images and you know the you know the stations of the cross and all of the all of the holy cards etc cetera, etc cetera. and I loved them I thought they were beautiful and and I I certainly have a profound relationship to 
Italian painting, Spanish painting. It's all very high drama. And the drama of the mass and the drama of the um, ceremony of the mass was always very prevalent. And I was, I, I can't say that I was ever devout or, well, maybe when I was a little kid and I can't even remember, but uh, I can't say that I ever uh, was 100% convinced, but I loved the music. My family's, my father's a singer and was a singer and I was a singer and we sang and we sang religious music all the time. So it was a big influence in my life. I want my paintings, I want to push my paintings to the, uh, I'm trying to think of the appropriate word, to what I feel when I look at van der Weyden's Descent from the Cross. Mm -hmm. I want, I do not want to take feeling out of my paintings. That was always, I wanted the whole card deck. I wanted to, I wanted to be as rigorous and as emotional as I feel towards painting. I'm very emotional about painting. I, uh, I have wept in front of many a painting. So I don't take that out of, I don't, I don't give that, I'm not, not ignoring that. And so it is a big part of my relationship to painting, probably bigger than I would be willing to admit to. But of course, I'm not, I'm not a believer now. And yet my, my, I mean, faith is essential to make anything. I mean, we're all flotsam and jetsam why are we putting more crap on the earth but we are because we have to and in order to make a painting that's going to take me a year i have to have a lot of the ability not to not to give in to my doubts which are constant so i understand faith and i understand believing in something and is really believing in painting any more absurd than believing in all the other things that people believe in you know? i agree yeah. yeah i mean dedication and religion are are so intertwined um, and to continue on that thread, I, I am so in awe of your dedication to the mundaneness of life. And, and I think your paintings are, are imbued with a lot of emotion. And there is something, uh, and I mean this as the greatest compliment, there is something profoundly sad about them. Mm -hmm. And... But I'm Russian, so I tend to... Yes, I know, no, I'm Irish, so I understand. We were meant to be, I understand, I understand. Um, but, and your work is often referenced as um, finding the beauty in the mundane. But for me, I think it's more that you find the interestingness of the mundane. And each mundane object that you paint has an, an individuality to it that you know, you're able to capture the fuzziness of a blanket to the point that that it becomes animated. It becomes a living being of its own. And uh, your work taps into this question that that we all ask ourselves every now and again, or maybe that's just you know the existential Russian. Um, but but the question is: This it? Is this is this what life is? And your work seems to say yes, it is but it's, it's infinitely more interesting than you think if you look, look closely enough. Well, you've brought up so many things that I think about. I mean, first and most importantly, what is beauty? For me, beauty is, is, is something that is not perhaps what other people think beauty is. I never paint anything that I do not think is beautiful, but I think it's beautiful probably because of how it, uh, it visually uh, jives or or ties into how I think about organizing a canvas and how I think about organizing information. Uh, you, you know, you'll see uh, repeated over and over again the my relationship to um, both painting and geometry and and you know this painting you have you have the blue blanket up. I'm looking at the blue blanket and the blue blanket came from I decided to take the horizon out of my, I was doing a lot of landscapes at the time and I decided to take the horizon out of the landscape because it was far too heroic. And it was, it was not my relationship to landscape. 
my relationship to landscape is also is is uh, uh, prescribed by uh, always being slightly fearful that I will be eaten by a bear or I will be uh, you know I will be something terrible I will die I used to call I used to call the landscape and I said where they found the body I mean you know I have a much more complicated or not more complicated a much different relationship to landscape than let's say somebody like Frederick Church or the people who were standing next to God I mean you know I, I'm out there by myself so I took the I took the horizon out of my landscapes and I'm I kind of missed it and I, I, you know, I said, oh, yeah, well, I don't know. And then I had a dream. And in this dream, I was putting this blanket down on this on, on the ground. And I, I woke up and I gasped and I went, ah, the blue blanket. And, you know, what this does is it takes the horizon, it takes these two rectangles, think of Bryce Martin, the sky and the, and the ground, and it takes the sky and just turns it sideways. And it is the sky is represented also by the dappling on the blanket. So I have just changed the geometry of what the horizon is to the ground uh, by putting one on top of the other. And for me, you know, that's beautiful. That solution has mathematical grace. So that's beautiful. It's ordinary, it's mundane, but for me, it's, it's the answer to a problem I didn't know need solving. And that's really what the paintings are rather than uh, it's when I recognize something as an answer that I've been waiting for. And sometimes I dream them, this is a dream and sometimes I see them, but always now, not always now, but often now I have to reconstruct them. I have to, to paint them because I always work from observation. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, really the, the, the thing is, it boils down to a definition of beauty and what you know how beauty changes and how beauty has always changed over the history of mankind. You know, like I, I, I think Fragonard is beautiful, but not because the clothes are pretty. I think Fragonard is beautiful because of how he organizes a painting. That's what painting is. Painting is organizing information that doesn't move and that people get to look at and think about that organization. It's you know I I am a terrible. I'm, I was terrible at math and I'm, I, I, I still am. But in fact, it seems to me to be as beautiful as E equals MC squared. You know, it's like, ah, mm -hmm. ah, that's what I feel when I look at these things. I'm well, surprised that you were bad at math. What? I'm you, surprised yeah. to hear you were bad at math. Oh, yeah. Uh, it wasn't my, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it, wasn't it wasn't good. It wasn't good for me, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I was going to ask you about, about that shift that occurred around 1980 from, you went from painting what was in front of you and, and maybe Nick, we can go through the early works now um, again, and then to the current work. Um, you went from painting what was in front of you, view from your window, um, interiors, etc. And then the shift occurred to uh, actually constructing the scenes. And so what, what triggered this transition? Um, it, it, it was a big transition, but, and it took a long time for me to understand it. I've always tried, I've always been struggling um, or interested, I won't say struggling. I've always been interested in my relationship to what the painting represents. I mean, what the story is, what the subject is of the painting. These are the same paintings, oh, again, twice, once in black and white, once in color. That's the, in, in color, it's not a drawing, that's the painting. Mm -hmm. uh, nevertheless, um, but the shift took a long time for me to understand that, um, and it has a lot to do with poetry. And I understood that how the poem tells the tale was much more appropriate for how I thought than how the novel tells the tale. Um, uh, I think the, the early paintings are more um, uh, like literature, like a novel. They, they tell it more like the 19th century. And, and honestly, I realized then when I did a painting called, I should have had you bring it up, called um, Screened Window, which is a nighttime window. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that painting and I said, finally, the form and the content and the story are one thing. 
And that's what a good poem does. And that's what I wanted to do. And more than Washington crossing the Delaware or the equivalent in the landscape, I really wanted it all to be one thing. And um, it's hard to do. And uh, it's, uh, I, I succeed and I don't succeed, but sometimes I succeed and it makes me very happy, but that's what I'm trying to do. So that was the big shift, but it took me a long time to understand how to do it. It took me a long time to understand how to organize the canvas. I mean, even Poussin is one muscle. Well, maybe it's a couple of muscles and, 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 and Chardin and, and uh, um, the, um, the zigzag that goes through the painting. It took me a long time to understand that I could organize the painting more simply. And that's what I did. And when it started, when I started to think that way, I then realized I also had to not lock myself into just painting what I could set up and paint, you know, because, and I don't want to change the subject, but what became a great influence on my painting is Spanish still life. Uh, the American, not the American Academy, the National Academy had a show of Spanish still life painting. And honestly, I'd never really seen it before. I'd seen, you know, Velasquez, I'd seen Goya, but I had not seen uh, Zuberan. I'd never seen Zuberan. I'd never, I'd never really taken note of Zuberan. And I certainly didn't know Cotan and Melendez and a lot of other people. And when I saw that with still life, I could um, have more control of what I wanted to do, then everything, everything in my show, even if it's a figure, is essentially a still life because of how I'm organizing the information like still life painters organize information. But the Spanish painting did amazing. I mean, there's a, there's a Zuberan, a very famous Zuberan painting at the Prado of a lamb that's tied up and for, the four legs are coming towards you and they're tied up with one rope. And I said, that's the greatest religious painting I've ever seen. And uh, you know, I said, oh, so my content could then be worked on as well so that I could have control over the whole that I wanted to be unified. So you see in a painting like this, which is very early 1969, you weren't even alive. Um, but it was, you know, this is, this painting is very complicated. This is my father's basement. This is my father's poker table. And so that was the story I had to tell, but then I didn't have to tell that story over and over again. So I changed it up. Yeah. The reason I brought up this painting and Nick, you can go to the next one and the one after that as well. Um, so this is a work from 2002, self-portrait. Yeah. And then the next one is a work that's in the current show. Um, and I that's think a, as we're, as we're looking at these, right. I like that. Yeah. Um, and as we're looking at these, I, I, well, there, there are three questions that I have. Um, firstly, as this transition took place from painting what's in front of you to constructing scenes, um, there was another transition where I feel that you moved closely to your subjects. Um, I did. Yes. This early self-portrait, you know, you see yourself from a distance and then and right. then you you essentially zoom in. Um, so I'm wondering how those two transitions were related, if at all. Um, well, it, I, you can see from these two paintings that I just learned to simplify the composition. I mean, I, I actually I became more interested in the in, in structure. And uh, a kind of, uh, I, was, I was also very influenced by minimalism. Very, mm -hmm. very, very, very much. I came up at the same time. I mean, this, uh, you know, working from life, working from observation, I've, I've always felt a kinship to people working through geometry. I, I really have. And it is the painting I, I love the most, the, mo the modern, the contemporary painting that I am most drawn to uh, when I, you know, I'm going out my busman's holiday. I'm probably looking at something mm. geometric. <laughs> so. you, did, you remained committed to to representation in, in in a time when it wasn't trendy at all, which is so admirable. Oh, it's not admirable. It just is. I mean, it's like it was like I was born to have be. I couldn't, you know, you you're young and you try out all sorts of things. And finally, you find something that makes you feel like you're not a fake and you do it. Even though it's not, you go, oh, God, I'd. I'd much rather do this, but in fact, 
I felt real. I felt like this is what I, I honestly felt this is what I had to do. I was, I, I'm, I am very, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. It's a, it's this town closest to Concord, Massachusetts. And so trans, uh, you know, like the, the transcendentalists are in my blood and I, uh, I love Emerson and I read Emerson and I think it's wonderful, but I uh, didn't know what I was doing. And I went home and I started painting my backyard and I was standing in my backyard and I was looking down a street, a street called Chase Avenue. And I was very young. I honestly, I was 20, maybe one, 22 years old. And I was just I was just doing, I was just making paintings because I didn't know who I was or what I was doing. And I was standing there painting, concentrating and standing and, 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 and thinking and working on the distance. It was in the, the distance of the painting and the wind moved through the trees in the distance, but I could not feel that wind because it was too far away. And that wind moved through my body. And I said, I've been waiting for that my whole life. And I always think that if I was a religious person, I would have been a preacher at that moment because it truly, it changed my life. And I went, I have to do this. And so some version of that, very different, it, it has changed over the years, but some version of that always happens when I'm painting, especially when the figure and the ground become one thing and I am working without language in the most abstract state that one can be in, it is glorious. So it isn't, it isn't admirable. I, I pity those who do not have never felt this thing that I feel. And yet they probably do in their own way. I don't think less of them, but it's less like, it's like, this is so glorious. How did this happen to me? How was I so lucky to be alive and do this thing and feel so alive? So I, 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 I have no choice. It's what I have to do. It's, it's, it's who I am. And I love, I love it. I love the history of it. I love, I love, I mean, the paintings that I love, I love lots of different kinds of painting, but the painting that I am devoted to is still Van der Weyden and Vermeer and all those people. I can't help it. It's just makes my heart beat fast. Mm -hmm. So I'm a lucky girl. That's if my heart's still beating for one thing, but beating fast is fabulous. Okay, good. I love that. Um, and I, I can relate, you know, in, in Russian literature, um, the landscape is often presented as an alternative to religion, like uh, who then in at the end of his life did also become very religious. But um, no, thank you for speaking about that so beautifully. And um, Another question as we're looking at these works that I have, but we can maybe look at some other drawings as well, is for you, the paintings are separate from the drawings. They're, they're unique. The drawings are not a study for the painting. No, um, but I do do drawings. Study, I do do study drawings for my paintings, but those but, aren't what you're saying. Exactly, saying. exactly. Usually, yeah. yeah. How do you decide when something is going to be a drawing? Okay. Hold on for one sec. Hold on for one sec. Ben? Yes. Uh, something is coming up on the side of my screen that... I don't want because I can barely <laughs> see. So I don't know what that is. Uh, this, what is that? <laughs> it, it looks like we just split the screen somehow. I didn't touch it. No, it's just it's just an email thing. And whatever. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. Um, I was going to ask how you decide when something is going to be a painting or a drawing. Uh -huh. So this, for example, are the are four views of your cameras. Mm. Um, yeah, it's. So uh, how, did you, how did you decide? Okay, this is going to be a drawing instead of a painting. It generally attaches itself to color. Would this be better in color, or would this be better in graphite? And that light that cameras make, that kind of cheap camera, a surveillance camera makes, I thought that blown out light would be really beautiful as a drawing. And it makes more sense to me. And you know, I started doing tonal drawings because it teaches me so much about color. 
uh, you, you know, you're constantly, you're constantly flipping between, you know, tone and shade and all those things of what does this mean? Is this lighter? Is this darker? It makes you sharper. It makes you, it makes you see color better. But in fact, some things are meant to be black and white. I know that that's a crummy answer, but honestly, uh, it's absolutely how I feel about that. And I also, um, particularly in this drawing, you know, the light is all paper. In other words, the paper just paper, the paper, the color of the paper is the, is the light. I don't add any color to make it lighter. And so that kind of light is best represented, it seemed to me, by this, the glow that comes from a piece of paper. So there's that that I'm looking for sometimes too. And uh, yeah, so that that's the answer to this drawing. But uh, what most, about that self-portrait? The the well, so that that I wanted the rip of the paper. So it had to be a drawing because I, I wanted the rip of the paint paper, and I wanted to go from paper to paper. You know, I, I you know this was a this is a I did a small drawing. I did a lot of small drawings, a little small, small self-portraits. And then I did one that didn't, I thought might work. And then I blew it up. I made another drawing this size of, you know, the dimension of this so that I could rip it and it would be, I would understand the rip and the smaller size I couldn't, the, the rip wouldn't have been the star. And I really <laughs> wanted the rip to be the action. And you tend to enlarge things. Uh, I make things <laughs> larger. I make things larger. I make things larger than life usually. Not always, but usually. I mean, certainly not in um, a night watch. But I, night watch is the is the size of the of the of the projection. It isn't <laughs> the size of the of the objects, but it's the size <laughs> of the projection, um, which of course in this case is the object. But um, I do, and um, it is because. There's something that, that is called the king seat, is which is where you're supposed to see a painting from, you know, where it's best viewed from, you know, and that, that's in parlance is called the king seat. And I realized that when my smaller paintings, that where you're supposed to see the painting from is exactly how I'm looking at you right now on the screen. And it was m much too small. It was when you were actually standing back in a room. It was the information, there's too much information on too small of a canvas. And so the paintings slowly but surely got bigger because I wanted them to be able to be read in a modern space, in a, in a, in a contemporary space and not in, you know, the pity palace. You know, it's really and truly, it's, it has to be seen in a museum or in a big house or whatever. I wanted it to have power still. And also, you know, um, deciding on scale is probably the m one of the most important things that I do about painting. And I always, I want the paintings to break out of genre, but I don't want them to be popped. So I don't want, they're not massive. They're, they're a, a size where I always think, for instance, in Begin Again, people are constantly putting their hand up to the hand and thinking it's going to be the size of their hand because oh, that's, that's how it reads. You know, that's how, when you're standing back from it, you can imagine it being your hand. But when you get, when all of a sudden you, you're approaching it with your hand, you go, oh, that's wrong. I was wrong about that. So, I mean, that's exactly how I want it to feel. I want it to feel like, oh, this is the right size. But of course it's not, it's bigger. Can we look at that painting, Nick? Sure. Uh, because it was also used as the, as the invite for your opening. Yes. It's yes. such a curious painting. Uh, I should have. I should have held my hand to it. I didn't even. <laughs> you can next time. <laughs> yeah. And, but there's also something about you know taking a mundane subject and enlarging it because there is such a hierarchy in still life and then what deserves to be represented and. Yeah. Um, well, that's just bullshit. I mean, what deserves to be represented? I mean, you know, I, I don't even know what that means anymore. I you know, I, I understand that, and I understand that in fact, you know, the Spanish and the Dutch we're finally seeing some Roman paintings and they saw, uh, I know, but there, there's some argument about who invented the idea of still life in, in, uh, in, in the, during the Renaissance or late Renaissance. Um, and, and in fact, still life was, nobody had any respect for it because it was, you know, you're supposed to be a great, you know, supposed to be able to paint a crucifix, not, and, and not, not a, a bunch of, of apples on a table, but uh, so it, it it, it seems to me 
that really and truly you're right. I mean, what deserves to be painted was a big, a big subject for still life painters. Like, you know, it's finally like, I don't know if this deserves to be painted, but I'm gonna do it anyway, you know, so. So this painting was a dream, a um, I, 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 wonderful dream. I, I was in the dream, I was just outlining my hand on a white wall. And I, I, even in the dream, I said, that's a painting. And I woke up and I went, well, it's not quite a painting. And I realized that if I actually did that, the hands would be too small. They wouldn't have the same power. They would mean something different. I mean, scale really does ascribe meaning. And, uh, you know, this is my, you know, this is, a, this is uh, in all the caves, you know that. And, you know, it's the, uh, and it was, what I loved and I didn't know was going to happen is that every painter who looks at this go, says, says to me, the first thing that comes out of the mouth is they say to me, the caves. And I said, yes, the caves. And uh, so I loved that. I thought that that was, uh, we do believe in something. And, uh, but then I put it on my wallpaper because it's also, it's about the apocalypse and it's about the end is also the beginning. And that's why I called it begin again. Well, this is, this is a, an er uh, action and it's not uh, children in the schoolyard and children in their art classes, but it's also everything. So I, I decided that when it all goes away, we'll just begin again. So, you know, the other day, I can't remember who it was that I was talking to. Maybe they're here right now, but uh, we were talking about cave painting. And this person told me how they had not realized, and and at that point I realized that I had not realized either, that cave painting wasn't flat. There was actually a lot, a lot of structure in the rock. And yes, and they used that structure. Tremendous they skill, yeah. Yes, but they and they also used the structure to like volumize some of the objects, some of the things they were trying. But the most amazing thing, and I talked to this about all, to all my students about this. I talk I talk about this constantly because it was such a moment in my life. Is when I realized I was just looking at a painting, a book of Lascaux paintings, and I was flipping through it, and there's a painting of uh, some kind of a reindeer or something. And in the corner, the left hand corner of the reproduction in the book, there was a rectangle that was drawn, just drawn rectangle. And I said, what the hell is that doing that? It must be graffiti of some kind. And I, and then I started looking into why that rectangle was there. And in fact, this geometry in all the caves, all the South Africa, Australia, even in America, and in, in uh, certainly in Europe, Spain, all, those, all the caves is geometry. Um, and they don't exactly know why, but of course you understand this pre-architecture, pre-agriculture. So, you know, the, the, why are those, why is geometry represented? And uh, they did a lot of studies about it. And um, I went to a few lectures about it and I, uh, one scholar um, explained it as uh, the caves were used because they were lower in oxygen and it was easier to go into a trance state. And even now when people go into TM, one of the first thing that happens in their trance is a geometry comes up, you know, a kind of geometric thing and then what they've, uh, geometric representation. And what they've decided is that geometry is in topic to our nervous system. And if you've ever had an optical migraine, um, which is a kind of a kaleidoscope of geometry happens around your eyes, when it's, there's lots of, you know, it can happen from light or it can happen from any number of ways. Anyway, geometry is in our bodies. And, you know, these, these, these things are so, my joke is it took, it took us a long time to get the reindeer into the rectangle. And then we took the reindeer out of the rectangle. But uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I was very taken by that. Very, um, a lot of painting really did come out of that. Mm. And your um, one of my favorite things in your paintings is how you uh, paint wallpaper, which we see here as well. I painted a lot of wallpaper. God help. A lot of wallpaper, and <laughs> even though maybe we can go to the painting of the staircase, both the early one and the one in the current show, you never return to the same subject or object, but you not do quite. you do repeat um, or not repeat, but you return to certain uh, scenes and themes, such as the staircase. Uh, and the wallpaper, and um, 
I won't use the word admirable again, but I will say that it's it, 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 it's so wonderful that you don't repeat yourself because I think that there is a certain danger for artists always to when they find something that works and mm -hmm. to then just keep repeating that same subject. And I'm I'm wondering what about, for example, in this case, the staircase scene and then uh, you know, this from 1980, and then the following slide is the one that's in the current show where there's the... Uh, not that one. Not that one. Oh, it, it came before. I guess it came before. Um, where there is a bathrobe mm -hmm. at the bottom of the staircase. I would love to hear first how you arrived at this painting. Uh, and then what about the staircase? Um, and, well, I have to answer another uh, thing. I don't repeat subject, but I do repeat form, and I repeat it over and over again. I'm I'm interested in both the 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 picture plane and the 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 surface of the canvas, and breaking a hole in the surface of the canvas. So I will do that over and over again. I will I will I will first of all, the top stair is reminding you that this is that the painting is always flat. The painting is always flat. Everything else is just magic. I mean, it's it's flat, and I want you to remember, and I want to remind you that the painting is flat. And so I will do that, and I will I I I it's almost a it's almost a necessity for me to remind the viewer that the painting is flat. And and in this one, I wanted to. Uh, this is set up. I mean, I I uh, you know I built the staircase. It's not the staircase in my house, and I had the people come and leave carpeting. I picked, I went and picked out the correct carpeting, but it and uh, I, I, I wanted to make you feel that you were falling. I wanted, I wanted it to be above flight and above falling, uh, and I, I threw a lot of things down the stairs before I arrived in the bathroom, and that. What was did you throw? Oh, everything. I mean, I tried everything. I tried, uh, you know, little objects. I tried lots of things. Uh, um, I don't know. You know, let's try boom. And, I, and nothing worked. And so, uh, you know, I, I and but it, it, sometimes I'll have an idea and it will take me 10, 15 years to actually realize what I want to do. And uh, subsequently, my husband asked me to throw his bathrobe down. I threw his bathrobe down. And it landed at the bottom of the stairs. I went, oh, <laughs> that's it. And it wasn't too depressing, but it was, you know, I understood what people were going to make of it. But I wanted you to feel your, I wanted it, I wanted you to start, I wanted you to have liftoff from that top step. I want the light and the most of the description, the most detailed description part of the description is that top stair. I want you to feel that under your foot. And then I want you to feel like you're falling down the way you actually. You might, it might be a resurrection. I'm not absolutely sure, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, but uh, you know, the, I, 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 you know, another staircase could happen mostly because I'm a little obsessed with that action. I do love throwing things down the stairs. I like a pussycat, I throwing, you know, I don't know if you've ever had a cat, but I don't if like you cats. put a pen on a table, well, if you put a pen on a table, the cat will go, what's that going to look like when it's falling? And I feel like that's what I'm doing. What's that going to look like when it's falling? So that interests me a lot. Um, uh, the other painting, the painting, the early staircase, that's my mother's house. That's the house I grew up in. That's the staircase I went up and down my entire life. And uh, I don't think it's any less oppressive than the other one. I think they're both kind of oppressive. And, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the wallpaper doesn't make cheer particularly, but uh, the elephants kind of do. But that's her collection of elephants. You know, I went back in the 80s and in the, in the 70s, I went back to my parents' house a lot to do paintings I felt I had to do. So, you know, I had to make visual my, you know, it's my look onward angel. This is my, this is my uh, revisiting of my childhood. Because 1980 That's my sister on the bottom of the stair. <laughs> yes. 1980 was the year that you moved to Hyde Park, right? Well, yes. Park. Yes, it is. So we we moved to Hyde Park from from Massachusetts, yeah. And yeah. do you feel that in a way that opened up more freedom for you to to experiment with well, what it really did was give me some stability. I mean, you, I, 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 every representational painter can tell you these stories. I was, 
I was kicked out. I was, I, people would take down houses. They would chop the tree down. They would, you know, it, it, you know, nature's enough to deal with, but people not wanting to meet in their backyard is yet another thing. And I, you know, like I was always in the way you have to understand. I was at the top of a staircase that nobody could come up <laughs> while I was painting, you know, so I'm, I was always in people's way. And so here I'm, I'm only in my own way. So it's much, it's, it's physically more possible to. I mean, that is a great feminist gesture, I think. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, I guess I am blocking something. <laughs> yeah. Taking up space. <laughs> right. And I, I actually take up space. I take up a lot of space. I take up a lot of space. The reason that I had put in that early self-portrait that you made was, was because I, I wanted to ask you, and I think Linda Nochlin, in fact, has, has written about that, that painting. Um, I wanted to ask you what, what it has been like to be a great female artist <laughs> in a male-dominated art world and how, whether anything has, how that has changed and evolved over time for you. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I don't ascribe anything to anything. I mean, it all seems like a miracle. Um, uh, I think that I'm a feminist. I am, I am, you know, 100% committed to this idea of who I am as a woman, but I, mm, making, um, assumptions based on being a woman artist versus just being an artist. I don't know if I can do that. I mean, I think I've had a lot of luck. Um, no, there's no artist that's ever satisfied with what's happened. None. I cannot find one. I, maybe they're dead or something. Maybe, maybe there were happy artists who thought that they got everything they deserved. I have not found one yet. My, uh, there's a wonderful artist who's, uh, whose work everybody should know named Rudy Burkhart. And I was friends with Rudy and Rudy took every photographs of everybody's paintings um, know, Rudy. during the fifties, you know, you know, his work, yeah. a great photographer, a great filmmaker, oh wonderful God. trainer. Mm -hmm. He's, he's, he's a fabulous human being. Um, and he took everybody's photographs. He took de Kooning's photographs. He, did, he was the guy who you called, to come take my photographs. And, you know, he did it for money. And, uh, and he told me once, he said, I've never met a satisfied painter. I've never met anybody who's satisfied with what has come their way. So am I satisfied? No. But can I be? Maybe not. So am I not satisfied, I'm, you know, because I am a female? I don't know. I, I don't, I honestly, from the bottom of my heart, cannot tell you whether or not that has plays any part of it. That I am a representational painter, I think far blocks far more people from loving me mm -hmm. than my being a female. I okay. don't know if that's true, but I suspect it's true. So that's, you know, like I, 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 I don't, I've never minded being um, of people having low expectations of what I'm going to accomplish. And I can, it, it, I can give them lots of surprises that way. So, mm -hmm. you know, so being a, a girl, when I was a girl, the nice part was there was nobody who made me have to be a lawyer. I mean, you know, be a painter, who cares? You're going to get married and have babies, you know, so go do whatever, do what you have to do. So there's that, you know, there was that thing. So I can't, can't give, I can look at the numbers and look at how many women make this amount of money, that amount of money, but I don't even know what that means. So, you know, so what? Some people like me, it's okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so. And you decided that you were going to be a painter very oh, early on. Very I think early. before you had ever vis visited a museum, right? I know. I, I thought I was going to be, I, 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 the first things I saw were, were illustrations in magazines. And I even thought I was going to be a painter then. And I didn't know what a painter was. And then my sister, my wonderful sister, uh, subscribed to John Kennedy's Paintings of the Met. And they would come in the mail once a month. And I would just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And then, then they took me to museums. So, uh, but I loved it. And I was always, I was always um, 
interested in, and people were interested in what I did. It was always something that I was encouraged to do. I was very encouraged to do it. Uh, that people, my father was dragged me to Saturday school and all that stuff. It was, I was not, uh, and uh, you know, so, but some of it's a miracle, but nevertheless, I always knew I was going to be a painter. I, 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 oh, my, I have recounted the story uh, many times, uh, but when I was, uh, my confirmation was uh, by a famous cardinal called Cardinal Cushing, and Boston Cardinal, and he confirmed my parish uh, of the kids making their first confirmation. So I was 12, and he asked if anyone had the vocation. And since I thought I knew what the word vocation meant, I raised my hand and I said, I have the vocation. And he said, oh, delightful, tell me. And I said, yes, I'm gonna be an artist when I grow up. So, uh, and he went, no, 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 that's not what I mean. So I declared at the age of 12 publicly that I was gonna be an artist when I grew up. So yes, for a long time. I love that. My, um, my grandmother from my biological father's side used to say that there were two groups of people that were followers of Satan. The first being the gays, and the, second, okay. uh, the first were gay people, and second were uh, modern artists. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, jeez. Um, but uh, yeah. Jeez, Kelly. Well, uh, Catherine, hearing, you say? <laughs> hearing you speak about your work, you make so many references to art history and to technique, and I know that you've been teaching painting for a long time, first at Yale, and now you're at Rutgers, and um, could you talk a oh, little bit about not that? At Rutgers anymore. What? You're not at Rutgers anymore? Oh, where are you? Well, no, no, I, 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 was, I was at Yale for 23 years, and then uh, Rutgers gave me a chair, and uh, I was a chair at Rutgers for three years, and then I went back to Yale for a little tiny bit and I said I'm done and uh, so I was done but I didn't teach you have I taught painting school but I taught lots of different kinds of stuff I wasn't painting specifically but I I love I love my students they were great I love teaching it's great what was it like to be a teacher and what what are some of the lessons that that you gained from from teaching well it, what you say is true I find, think I always thought I've learned more than they did but uh, I, I just, the delightful thing and the thing I loved about Yale so much is that you, I did critique. I, I also, I sometimes, I taught a class for a little while, but not too long, but mostly I just did critique. And um, one of the only things I insisted on it was that everybody in the class had to see me even if they didn't want to, at least once. And so going there was like Christmas. I would open the door and I never knew what I was going to get on the other side. And it was such, it was, it, it, it stretched me, it stretched my um, uh, thinking tremendously. Uh, the students were fantastic and some of them were just so delightful, but, um, and some of them weren't, but that was great too. You know, I just learned so much. Um, so you mentioned technique and I don't, I think technique is just armament against the possibilities of yourself. I don't, I don't teach technique. And I don't believe in it. And I think that technique is something you find out what you need when you have a concept or an idea. You then you find out how you need to, what you need to know to make that happen. And uh, I don't, I, you know, I think, um, you know, every, every, everything I do is both practice and the real thing. The, the last, everything is the last painting I'll ever do, the last drawing I'll ever do, the first drawing I've ever done the first painting I've ever done you know it's, it's very much like that and I would love that for my for any student I've had and so I don't I don't teach technique I don't I don't even I, I truly don't believe in it I can't I it, that's death for me that's kind of like putting a pot over the taking the oxygen out of a painting wonderful so do I teach painting? I taught, I really, well, this is what I think painting is. I think this is how you teach painting. You make them tell you what they think they're doing. And then you say, well, this is what I see that you're doing. You mm -hmm. know, this is, this is, this is, this is how your thinking has been manifest, made manifest. This is how it is existing in the world. This is how mm -hmm. I read it. I'm not the only person who will read this painting, but I'm not the stupidest and I'm not the smartest probably, but I'm not the stupidest. So this is, this is what painting, this is how I teach painting is like, to, to make real 
what somebody else's vision is in their own life and their own painting. So I'm not teaching what I do. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you froze for me. I don't know if it was just me. Oh, now you're back. Oh, yeah, sometimes you freeze. Oh. I'm back. Yeah, I think it comes and goes. Now back. you're back. Um, I, okay. I'm curious if you have a favorite a scene, the current show. In your current show. I have many show. favorites. I have many favorites. Well, I have a moment that I adore. I have a moment that I adore in mm -hmm. this show, and it's it's so beautiful. And uh, uh, I love Peter's gallery, and I, it you know that's such a great space. But the moment I adore is you stand in the middle of the big room and you look from in one direction at the at a canopy, and you turn around, and the other direction is um, uh, prequel. And mm -hmm. for me, that's everything it's like uh good that's good are they they're, they're two paintings i love but if i don't like it you ain't gonna see it so uh that's for sure so yeah but you can have... see i mean you know when i say i repeat form you see this grid of you see this grid of uh, buckets and if you flip to um uh, kitchen door you'll see a grid on a, on the floor you'll see grids all over this all over the show one kind of grid or another this is a grid in space but nevertheless it's a grid so yeah and also yeah. The, i did this painting out, i don't i didn't go ahead uh um i didn't i did this painting outside this is kitchen door you see you see and you see those things and perspectively they're both very difficult but uh yeah it took me a while to realize it was a doormat. Oh, the, I everybody in the country has that doormat, so and, you would know it if you lived up here. And it's because I'm not from I'm not from here, and I've only ever lived in New York City, yeah, in the United yeah. States. So uh, I've never had a doormat like that. Uh, Nick, can we go? I think to everyone in China knows what that doormat is too. Because your um, the prequel is informed by an earlier work that you made. Yes. View of yes. the school. We have an image of that. Um, we do. And then the next one. That's Is that a conscious cool. decision that that you were gonna return to view from the business school. Well, uh, could you go back to prequel? Uh, in order to do my paintings, you see the little um, little rectangle in the bottom left hand corner of mm -hmm. the paint of the, of the drawing right here um this is a mechanical for that painting uh in order to know what scale i want to make a painting i uh this is this is an old technique i don't know why everybody doesn't know it because it's wonderful it's so smart um you draw a diagonal through the points of the drawing and sometimes this is a, a you know a drawing of the drawing but you draw a, a, a diagonal through it and you say so I think this painting should be three feet, or I think this painting, I'm thinking four feet, something I'm thinking of, a, I'm thinking of a number. So then, then, so you draw this diagonal, and then you draw four feet up, just if you're guessing four feet. And then you make a line over there, over, you know, across, and you have the proportion of the painting, which is the same as your drawing. And I do it on my wall, and they're, they're all over my studio. And this is my studio in a bedroom upstairs, which I've never painted over because I've done the, uh, the wallpaper so often. Um, and that drawing, because I thought it was beautiful, I never took it down. I painted over most of them because I need to keep doing it. I need to keep seeing the proportion and seeing what I think the image can hold as far as size is concerned. You know, this this image is too small, this image is too big. If you see in this one, there's a smaller um, uh, oval in the middle, this is, it's suggested in the middle, there is a different place of, you know, I, I brought the painting, that's how big the painting was gonna be. And then I said, that's too small. And so I brought it up another couple of inches and I said, okay, that's better, that's, that's right. And then I proceeded to paint and, and so, I moved into this farmhouse in 1980, and this room that I used as my studio for many years before I built a studio up back had this wallpaper. And this wallpaper had two different wallpapers, which the people said, okay, that's like Victorian, that's like Victorian, I'll put them next to each other. And I thought they were so beautiful that I said, I'm not gonna, I won't paint over that, I like it too much. And so 
what you can't see in this reproduction, but is very prevalent when you're looking at it. Um, I live with this for, when was, when was uh, View from the Business School done? Like 20 years ago, 95, right? 95, yeah. You, you froze. 1995. Mm. My back. Can everybody hear me? I don't even know if you- I can still hear you. Yep, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I, okay, so it was done. It was done more than more than twenty years ago. Yes. Yes, more than twenty years 26. ago. Mm -hmm. But I left. Oh, no. um, Harry or Ben? It says my connection is unstable. Do you know why that would be? Catherine, it may that may appear, but you're coming it's through pretty well. Oh, okay, very good. So this, uh, you know, that that drawing was up for more than 20 years and I loved it, but I didn't know how to use it. And if, could you go back to prequel? I'm sorry to, can you go back to prequel? Yeah, it's, it's, it's up. It's probably your connection. Uh, that's not, um, yeah. uh, nothing's happening, but we're seeing prequel. Okay. Um, Did it appear? Yeah. No, that's the business school. Oh, could you I'm, go back to prequel? I'm seeing prequel. Yes, thank you. Um, and I and so I looked at this for a long time, thinking I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with that. Okay, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do with that. And then I was doing another piece of work, and I had a spot, and there's a spot that's lighting up the middle of this. And so what excited me was that you know this was beautiful. This grid was beautiful with this drawing on top of it, but it didn't make sense for me until. I could, uh, you know, the, until I introduced the space between the light and the object. And so the space in this painting is not through the painting, but it's in front of the painting. I don't know if I ex explained that well enough, but that's what it truly excited me was that the space, I was making the space from the outside in. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, finally did this thing I wanted to do for 20 years. I just didn't know how to do it. So that's what prequel is about. And view from the business school is, is both the muscle of a, a, a geometric form and the classical SZ of, uh, of uh, Poussin that goes, you know, the, these plates, they're made for all the Ivy League schools. Liel has them, Vassar has them, yeah, you know, Harvard, this is Harvard. This view from the business school is, is Harvard plates. And you know, you go in, you, this is how you're supposed to enter a painting. When you, uh, you, you enter in the right-hand corner, you take a nice walk on a diagonal this way, and then you go that way. And so this is an absolutely classical landscape that I've turned into a still life. Um, and it was very exciting for me to do this. I, I love doing this painting, but I love doing prequel too. So I went from there to there. That's what 25 years will show you. And prequel really stand out stands out from the other works because it kind of is like an abstract composition, essentially. They all are. All painting is abstract. All painting is narrative. You've said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say it over and over. I said it's every student I've ever seen. I know it's the, it's like it's this it's this continuum. We're all on this continuum, and we've just chosen different ways to be on the continuum. But this <laughs> is what is true about painting. I believe it with all my art. We have hit an hour. Um, and I see that we have 81 messages in the chat. So I think maybe this is a good time to, for me to stop talking and to open it up to questions. Sure. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm going to pull down the screen share. Uh, I want to start by thanking you both so much for this conversation. It's been beautiful and um, inspiring. I'm, I'm very happy to dig into some of the questions we've received. Um, so first, I am going to pass the mic over to uh, Julian in the audience. Julian, you should be able to turn your microphone on now. Wow. Okay. Thanks, Nick. And uh, Catherine, it's great to see you again. And Oh, hi. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. nice to see you. See you virtually. Uh, yes. So uh, kind of a shot question. Uh, Assuming you experience different moods and different levels of personal energy when you're in, this, in the studio, does it affect your perception of your work? And if so, how do you, do you have any strategies to deal with it? I mean, like some days one may be energetic, 
and up and other days tired and depressed. And I know it affects how I perceive my own work. So I'm curious if you reflect. Well, that's on. an interesting question. I just think it's all finally in the painting. I mean, I think that the, the lack of energy and energy are all in the painting somehow. And I just leave it be, you know, I just, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I honestly, for the most part, I can go in, it, it, I can go in, it, I can go in one way and come out another way. And that is more likely than energy and not energy. I can go in, I can go in with uh, understanding and, and confidence and come out a beaten woman, or I can go in a beaten woman and come out with confidence. So I, uh, I, I, I think that really that's, that's more likely than than energy, no energy. I don't do anything but paint. So, uh, you know, and I can I can paint and cry. I can paint and, I can paint and not sleep. I can I just paint. I just what it's what happens. And honestly, a painting that takes a year can hold a lot of information as far as mood is concerned. But I don't I only know that painting is even if it makes it worse, it's going to make it better. The act of painting, even if it's even if I come out miserable. I still would have painted that day. And, and honestly, I really try to keep in mind that you would be a fatalist and it was supposed to go bad today. So it can go good tomorrow. So I think that that's more likely, that's, that, that does happen, but I, I pay it no mind. I gotta show up, that's, I gotta show up. That's, I show up and then something happens. But honestly, sometimes I can show up and I can think of good things, but, and then bad things will still happen. So I'm, I'm prepared for anything, you know? So I think that answers your great. question. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Thanks thank for asking. Thank nice you, Julian. You. <laughs> and thank you so much, Catherine, for that, for that wonderful response. Um, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Josephine Halverson. Oh, Josephine, Josephine, you should be able to, Hello. there you are. <laughs> Yes. Hi, Kathy. Thank Hello, you so Josephine. much. It's so nice to, to hear this talk. Um, oh, thank you. So lovely to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's great to see you. And I haven't seen your show yet. So oh, um, well. I haven't been in New York and I'm going to see it very soon. Um, one, I really loved this talk. And in particular, I, I, I was very interested when you spoke about organization. And I have, I'm interested in organization as well. And I've, in my, on the canvas and off. Um, and I've thought about organization sometimes as a way to kind of plan for the future, where if you put something where it belongs and you know where to find it the next time in the future. And, um, and thinking about the way you spoke about organization within the four corners of the painting, but also this kind of retrospective looking at your work, your own lived history. I'm kind of wondering, um, you know, if you have any further thoughts on that relationship between organization and time um, and the kind of past, present, and future tenses and the way that corresponds to the organization of a painting. Um, mm, that's such a good question. Um, that's such a good question that I probably don't have an answer for. I think that, first of all, when I was younger, uh, very much younger, I really thought I could be a journalist. I'm, I mean, no. A painter, but a journalist painter. In other words, I was just going to tell the story. Just, just you know, get out of the way. Get out of the get out of the, get out of the way. Just do it. Um, and then I realized that any organization of material or information instantly makes it a fiction. And I, that was very important. That that for me is you know this is this is the argument against you know, the, 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 uh, that historians have to deal with it now, because in fact, you've, they've organized, you know, the, the winner organizes the history and thus we view history as truth. In fact, it is uh, just somebody's organization of history. Um, and and, and all, all art is a fiction because it is all an organization. Now, where I believe the truth lies is in that organization. I believe that that for me is fact. Fact for me is the artist's desire and need to organize that information. I love thinking about that. And I don't think when I was younger, I did think about that. I thought in a, in a kind of, I, I didn't think about it self-consciously. I thought about it 
naturally and you know I was an art student I you know I was, I was taught to make compositions and and certain very you know fundamental rules of two-dimensional design but then when I started thinking about different ways to organize paintings and space Space and time, you can't take apart space and time. They're one thing. It's like, that's just what it is. And when I realized that all paintings talk to past, present, and future tenses, and that, you know, that the, that the foreground of the picture and that the, the part of the painting I'm trying to connect to the picture plane is my present tense. And then even though there is no such thing as present tense, nevertheless, that I'm organizing a painting in time and space is very different than just organizing space, even though it's also the same thing. But this is things I think about that I very rarely talk about. So you maybe talk about something that is very interesting to me. And I, you know, I, 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 you know, when when you know Ryman brought painting up to the surface of the canvas and when it did to the picture plane, you know, where else is there to go but back into it? So I was very, I, you know, I did a whole bunch of paintings that I felt like were, I was breaking the top of the creme brulee that I was like, back, future, future tense, past tense. Cause I've always thought of the depth of the canvas as being both past and future tense. So I was like breaking that surface in so many paintings of, of just to, to explain that happenstance. I think I've talked about things I wasn't willing to talk about. Thank you, Josephine. <laughs> because these are things I'm still working on. These are things that I'm still struggling with. So, you know, I don't even know what they mean yet. So it's very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Good you. I, I um, uh, That's so interesting. And I, in that sense, um, uh, it may be maybe your, you know, the training that you've put yourself through in terms of observation makes you an, indeed a kind of most effective journalist um, in that kind of self awareness But, but in, what I also realized was that style was inevitable. I mean, that's the other thing that I realized. I really thought I was, I really thought I could make painting without style. And then I'd walk into a gallery and lo and behold, my paintings look different from everybody else's. I mean, they looked, they had a style. So I, I always tell students who are worried about style, I always go, it'll happen. I mean, you know, style just happens. Paint, style happens. So I I got there, but I certainly didn't try. But when I realized style was inevitable, that's when I stopped calling myself a journalist. <laughs> you know? Thank yeah. you so yeah. much. Um, no, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Josephine. Thanks for a great question. Thank you so much, Josephine and Catherine. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to G.E. Schwartz. G.E., you can turn your mic on now. Thank you so much, Nick, and and um, and and and, and uh, Catherine, your 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 greatness can't be honored enough. But um, <laughs> my, my my question is, how did you arrive at the realization that form and subject could in fact be mutually inclusive and not exclusive? That's interesting. Well. I, I came to the conclusion by looking at looking at painting. I saw that it happened. I mean, it's like reading poetry. I mean, you read you read poetry and you realize they can't be separate. And if then if they can be separate, then maybe that's illustration. But this is you know like I I, I you know and that's but when when I I I just saw it happening, and I saw that I wasn't uh, that I needed to do that. I needed to have it be happen. I needed to do it in my own painting. I still don't know how I do it. I mean, I often think I I I'm, I have a dear friend. I'm dear, one of my dearest friends in the world, Sylvie Mangold, and uh, I I was one time I was talking to her about a show I wanted to organize about finding finding the form and I wanted to organize a, a show around I was going to show Giacometti and I was going to show Sylvia and I was going to show myself and a bunch of people that I knew and I and I said I said I'm so excited about this and she said only painters care about this you can't get somebody to do this show and so I said oh that might be true so you know since I'm always working out how did I come to this idea what is this idea is this did this come out of form did it come out of subject? Did it come out of some kind of psychological need that I needed to, my father dying? I mean, is this, is this something I don't understand? 
how these things, why am I dreaming this form? How does it, how does it arrive at, you know, at, you know, at completion and, 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 and it never, it's never easy. Well, it's often, it's often not easy, but I somehow have to make it work somehow, but I don't know how, I don't know how that happens, but when it happens, I can recognize it, but uh, still it's, it's a, it's an, it's a, Good question, but uh, I don't think painters care about it. <laughs> you know, but maybe poets. Poets care about it too. Poets care about it. So. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, GE and Catherine, of course. Um, uh, we have time for just two more questions. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to Chi. And I apologize, Chi, if I'm mispronouncing your name, but you should be able to turn on your mic. Okay. Hi, Catherine. Hello, dear girl. <laughs> um, I have a question about Rembrandt. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I was just, uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like when I'm going through your show and, uh, you know, see cave painting, for example, with the first hand ones, and then, you know, uh, reading a title, Night Watch. Well, Cape painting is not Rembrandt, but you know what I mean. Um, Night Watch and then uh, prequel, you know, being the circle and then, you know, Rembrandt's uh, famous self portrait of like a, what is it? Um, uh, with two circles in the back. And then, you know, him supposedly referencing to Giotto and then, you know, your uh, self portraits and uh, I felt like, especially with in this show, maybe there's more. Um, I noticed a lot of uh, uh, conversation with Rembrandt, and I just, I was just like curious. Well, That's my <laughs> I love Rembrandt. I love Rembrandt. I love Rembrandt, and I, I, you know, certainly I've, I've looked at a lot of Rembrandt. I never disappoint. But I didn't. I mean, Night Watch. I had to call it Night Watch. I mean, when I thought of calling it Night Watch, I went, oh. I'm going to call it night watch, uh, but, but it, you know, and, uh, but um, I can't say he's in the forefront of my thinking, but uh, I, I do love him. And I, I love, I love, there's light in this painting and light plays, there's light in the show. There's lots of moments of light. The um, head to toe is dappled light and, and, and uh, the, the uh, uh, camo is backlit. And so, I always think of when I think of Rembrandt and, and I, that is different in the show than many of my other shows. So there's a real, I really, I really was loving thinking about light and the light on prequel is so important to me. And it is almost a, it's not chiaroscuro exactly, but it is, everything's chiaroscuro, but it's, uh, um, yeah, he's there. They're all there. I mean, honestly, I, I have, I, that's the best thing about being a painter. You having these conversations with so many people, and uh, you know, there's no time. There's, uh, you know, there's time. Time merges, and there's, you know, they're all my peers. I always feel like, you know, even though I hope I've added something to the conversation, nevertheless, you know, I, 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 you know, I think of making Giovanni Bellini proud, but I don't know if I do, but I, they're all there. But so is a lot of modern people. I mean, so is, so is uh, Cezanne, Cezanne's always there. But if you, don't, said, if you don't mind me saying, I really appreciate it that, that you reminded us all that the continuation of painting conversation is going it's going, <laughs> and thank you. Yes, it is. It, it is, and I, you know, I, it's foolish to think it isn't. I, I know. I've, I, uh, I've. They've told me painting died three times in my seventy-six years, so I, I, I don't believe them. I, I love painting. I think it can do everything. <laughs> right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you both so much. Um, I and I agree. Um, I love it. I was the, I, what you're pulling up are people that I love. So this is spectacular. <laughs> yes, thank you. Of course, it's my pleasure. Um, yes. But we, we we are nearing the end here, and it's our tradition to pass the mic over to the Rails' own Fong H. Bowie to ask our final question. Um, Fong, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, Fong. Hello. Hola. Hi, Catherine. Uh, Cassini, very wonderful 
conversation having with Catherine here. Yeah, you say earlier, Catherine, um, about your epiphany, you know, um, and your 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 declar declaratively so saying that transcendentalism is your DNA, um, because around Concord with Emerson, it, I just realized since I'm rereading Emerson and Thoreau and the whole idea of becoming the counter frictions against the machine, you know, mm. um, critique around civil disobedience, you know, thinking about that lately, lately and having gone just the second show of Jasper in Philadelphia and the first show at the Whitney, I felt this incredible, profound, pragmatist attitude towards image and painted, you know, form the image to something which is made by hand, which is the thing and the painting simultaneously, that I feel there's an infinity that you do with Jasper. Not so sure how I put it el more eloquently, but there's also the emotion present that I feel similar to Kristen in the work, your work. I, 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 I... I'm sorry, now what was the last word? I, you blocked out for a second. There's an emotional present that I feel in your work that remind me of Gustin's work, the late oh, work. Th thank you very much. And thank I was you. doing the two, thinking, going further back to Emerson, of course, who died in, in Concord, um, not far from, you know, Amherst. I mean, it's Amherst from Concord, because it's an hour away, um, which is Emily Dickinson. Right. Uh, they, yes, they didn't. Yeah, uh, yeah. Opinion, yeah. Thinking about your epiphany, I can't help but see one say, "Bring me the sunset in the cup." You know, and I, well, I feel, you know, you talk about you, you're talking about pragmatism. You know, transcendentalism and pragmatism are separated by the separated by the Civil War, and uh, but honestly, I, 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 yeah. So I, I think that uh, uh, that most artists are a little bit uh, are transcendentalists slash pragmatists. So I think that that's you know both 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 of them reside in me for sure. But uh, uh, yes, um, when I say out of my DNA, it's just uh, you know all the history I was taught and how much I how much time I spent um, thinking about those people uh you know all of them hawthorne melville all of the all of the american the, the early american writers and i've read them extensively and uh so i i think that that was encouraged by my grammar school so that you know i visited they talked about they had living history well the the remains of a living history to educate us with and they did so that's what i meant by that it, it is uh it is part of my history as well as the Catholic Church. There's a lot of there's a lot of Emerson and lots of transcendentalism in me as well, you know. So yes, I, I'm glad uh, you thought of Gustin. I love Gustin. Uh, he's brave. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah. so are you yeah. Catherine, you're brave and mm -hmm. uh, yeah the, it's a beautiful show, profound show and uh, couldn't agree more with been asked around the world. Thank you, Fong. Go see the show, you guys. It's a <laughs> yes, go see the show, people. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Gotta go to the show and stay as long as as long as need to, and uh, be sure to tell Peter it's a great show too. I, I will. It, yeah, and uh, I will. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, back to you, Nikki. Thanks. Thank you, Fong. Sorry, I don't want to talk over you, Ksenia, but no, no, no. Uh, I was just thinking Fong, and then of course I have to thank Catherine. This was well, so thank you. such a pleasure. Thank you so much. I this has been a, such a sincere pleasure to to uh, be here for this conversation today, and I want to thank you both. And I want to echo what Fong said to um, if you're able to to go see the show at Peter Freeman. Uh, it's on view through January eighth of twenty twenty two. I just posted a link in the chat. Um, but here at The Rail, we have another tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Lynn Crawford, to the virtual stage. Fiction and arts writer Lynn Crawford is a founding board member of the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, a 2010 Kreska Literary Arts Fellow, 
and a 2016 Rauschenberg Writing Fellow. Her newest novel, Paula Ragossi, was published in May 2020 by Trino, Trinoff's Apologies. Uh, Rebecca can correct me on that one. Um, Lynn earned a bachelor's degree from University of Michigan and a master's of social work from New York University. She has worked in various psychiatric, community, hospital, museum, and school settings, and she lives with her family in the north of Detroit. Uh, so without further ado, over to you, Lynn. You should be able to turn your mic on now. There you are. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm a little bit... Uh, that conversation was so brilliant. I just, I don't know how anything can follow it. I feel like we had hors d'oeuvres, dinner, dessert, and it was perfection. So I think I'm just gonna make this short, but thank you. Um, I also just wanna take a moment to give a, from the bottom of my heart, a shout out to the Brooklyn Rail. These new social environment um, conversations have provided such a window into our time, whether it's visual art or literature or activism or science. And the ideas, the global ideas that we've all who are participating been exposed to and interacted with are astonishing. And the community created around this gathering is just a reminder that, you know, we're all better together. Um, and that's a little bit, I guess now I'm realizing that this new book I'm reading from is totally inspired by this. And the book is called Imaginary Dinner Party. I'm not gonna read long at all. But the idea of this is this character, um, she lives in the trees in a, in a tree house and it's filled with books and there are floor to ceiling bookshelves. So it has to be a sturdily built tree house. And the person who builds that for her is named Carl. And she loves her book so much that she decides to pick two of them and have an imaginary dinner party. And it's part fiction and part literary analysis. I'm gonna read a very short part of the fiction. The two books she chooses are Things by the French novelist, George Perec, who was a member of the Uli Po. And the other book is Braiding Sweetgrass by Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teachings of Plants. So that's what informed this piece of fiction you're gonna hear. Our climate is humid, but I keep my home airy and dry for the books. I step down my home's ladder, take a few steps, then stop. Put my forehead against one of the trees on my path, then my hands on its trunk and breathe. I touch my ears, the left, then the right briefly to it and spend a final sweet moment of exchange between the rough fragrant bark and my skin. I pat and kiss the tree and continue on to my first stop today, the library. Walking to town, I breathe in the moist morning air, hoping it might nourish my skin, mood and lungs. I reach the library which has floor to ceiling windows with views of docks, ships, and the sea. That's where I first spot Carl, the man who becomes my builder. There I see him on his boat, scrubbing its deck and readying fishing lines. Fishing is inherently optimistic, he says, in one of our earliest conversations. It's the same with reading and specifically mixing books, I think, but don't say. Carl and I have separate interests. He, sailing, fishing, diving, music, and construction work. Me, books. But we do share a belief in effort, even if it leads to failure. My list of failures is long, but where would I be without them? Not better off. I sense quickly and assimilate very slowly. It takes time to identify something and more time to absorb, and even more time to know what to do with it. The periods between those stages, sense, assimilate, implement, are difficult. So much can go wrong, but I stick with them rather than stare at the floor and nurse potential grievances. This morning, our library, as usual, is populated with people browsing shelves, hunched at desks and tables, 
reading journals and novels, school textbooks, sitting with eyes closed or taking notes, writing letters, making lists and staring out windows. Sometimes I visit for the smell of so many books together or to look at people. I can't stay long in part because of the overstimulation, but mostly because I never interact publicly with books. The thought of someone, anyone watching me and a book together is upsetting. Written words make their way deep into all my open spaces. And if I'm anywhere near people, it means that they too can enter them. I read alone at home. But I do love our library, the clerks, the views, the new and old titles, the visitors who nod and smile, stand outside for a smoke, sometimes mistaking me for a staffer and asking where the recent book section is and can I recommend a specific read for them or their friend or daughter? Yes is always my answer. I don't read books at the library, but I do think about them, especially specific passages. This morning at home, I copied down the one by Karl Marx used by George Perec at the end of his novel, Things. Here's the Marx quote. The means is as much part of the truth as the result. The quest for truth must itself be true. The true quest is the unfurling of a truth whose different parts combine in the result. That passage helps me understand quest as a holistic structure, fusing a resolve with a goal and inner functionality. A point running through braiding sweetgrass, whose author, Dr. Robin Rall Kimmerer writes, we make a grave error if we try to separate individual well being from the health of the whole. Armed with these words, I head down the library's steep steps to visit Builder Carl to show him the passage. When I get to his boat, I hand him the slip of paper with the words I hand wrote. He reads them and smiles and says he is partial to Karl Marx, not just because they share a name, but because they both build. He builds boats, shelves, and docks from wood. The other Karl builds theories and systems from words and thoughts. He then goes on to say, I respect that books are your universe, but don't forget that trees, water, and lands hold medicines too. I love my books, and love means never letting your beloved down, but I did. I do, because I get this far and am ready to say a line like, land holds many medicines, before wondering how much I know about land, any land, including this land I'm living in, including this land I'm living on. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Lynn, um, for sharing this with us and, and for your, your beautiful and kind words and, um, and your friendship. Uh, I want to echo what uh, Rebecca shared in the chat that um, Lynn, uh, part one through three of Lynn's imaginary dinner party is in Detroit's art journal, Threefold, with a link to, to go check that out. So once again, thank you, Lynn. Um, of course, thank you, Ksenia. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'd like to also thank Peter and Madeline and the extended staff at Peter Freeman for helping to make today's program possible. Um, and last but not least, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, uh, where we will upload today's conversation shortly. And we're here every day, so join us tomorrow at a special 2 p.m. time for our 63rd Radical Poetry Reading, curated by I.S. Jones to celebrate the release of her chapbook. Um, Thank you all again so much. Thank you for the kind words in the chat. And you can all uh, now turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye. And congratulations, Catherine. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Catherine. Bye. Hey. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank you, Catherine. Thank, Thank you, Ksenia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for Chicago. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You much. I love this, Kathy. <laughs> oh, hi, sweetheart. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. It was better than going to the show. I really got to talk. I will listen to you talk. You're wonderful. <laughs> hi. Bye, bye, sweetie. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> Miss you. Bye bye. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great Thank reading, you. Lynn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. It's truly beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank beautiful you. afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much, all of you. Congratulations, Thank you. Thank you. Catherine. Go see the sun, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fong. Okay. Love you, Fong. Bye bye, all. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your paintings. Oh, thank you for yours. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Have a great thank day. You. Be safe. Take Bye. care. Bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Nick.